was very bad. With the introduction of uh, Tibetan as a medium of instruction, I found a profound change. I found children so active, energetic, because they know what they are saying, and they know what is being asked. But slowly as they reach higher classes, and uh, Tibetan mindset, as pointed out, at home, we don't permit our children to talk too much. If they ask too many questions, we shut them down. So we don't provide them the environment at home as well as in the school. So if we provide uh, this provi uh, creative, critical thinking, uh, creative thinking environment at home as well as in the school, I'm sure uh, children will start participating without fear and uh, without the fear of being ridiculed. Because now, the naked truth is that there are so many teachers who uh, does not like students who ask very critical questions. There were cases where a, stu a, t a student tell me, when I ask the teacher a question, and his answer is, are you testing my knowledge? And with this answer, the spirit of the student is crushed forever. And the second thing is that we don't, um, uh, when I say we don't, it doesn't mean there are good teachers who do a lot of things. But in general, if you talk, we are not providing uh, the f facility to learn on their own. The easiest method is to write ready-made answer, and um, uh, a correction is become very easy when it's ready-made answer given. And therefore, and uh, there are also cases where students, when they write answer on their own, they don't get mark. This same incident happened uh, last year. One class seven student, he came with to me with. Uh, answer sheet, he said, Madam, my answer is right, but sir has not given mark because that is not the way my sir wrote. These are the reality. So we, a teacher, should learn to appreciate unconventional ideas, unconventional, uh, what you say, activities, or all this, if we are patient enough to understand and appreciate. I'm sure it will take uh, some time, but if we consistently make effort, I'm sure over the years, we will definitely find a big difference in the way our Tibetan children interact. Many a time, um, they say that Tibetan children are below average. And uh, of course not, uh, Tibetan children are not below average. They have lots and lots of potential, but not tapped properly. Last year from uh, NCRT, uh, Assistant Professor, Associate Professor Dr. Tiwari was deputed to our school for three months. <coughs> and uh, he uh, said, before se uh, he was deputed to CST Moongot, he never knew the existence of CST schools. He never knew that there's a separate school for Tibetan. And he was a bit afraid of uh, going to such a remote place like Moongot and having to deal with an unknown uh, uh, student. And he went and approached a few uh, his colleagues and uh, they said, oh God, these Tibetan children, they are below average. They don't study. You'll face lots of difficulties. Of course, then he came down and he stayed with us for three months and right from morning assembly till the remittal teaching, he was observing every activities of the school. And that after completing three months, uh, in the farewell party, he said, 
What I was told and what I've learned is totally different. D you have so many children who are genius. And Tibetan children are not below average, they are above average. Provided you all handle them, instruct them in the right way, they will shine. And it will not be out of place to say that uh, in my school I didn't have a uh, chemistry teacher throughout the year, except what was taught by uh, Dr. Tiwari for three months. And of course, uh, with help of DOE, there was the intensive uh, coaching for one month at uh, Darwar. And the physics teacher came in the middle of the academic session. In spite of all that, I found that my children have done, in spite of not having a regular teacher, in spite of having teacher just halfway, they have done extremely well. As a quality, you can't expect everybody to get above 95 when I didn't have teacher to help them. And a funny thing is that uh, out of uh, 39 uh, students who uh, appeared for class 12 science, two failed. And these two staff students, not from <laughs> Not the uh, word of uh, illiterate uh, parents, but staff. So what I mean to say is that the, even if uh, parents are highly educated, if children are not properly motivated, I don't think uh, they can uh, shine or they can come out uh, really with a wonderful result. So what I would like to stress is that we need to believe that our children have lots and lots of potential. We need to handle them carefully. We need to strengthen their strength, not keep on highlighting their weakness. Normally in the school, I find we teach her, keep on pointing out the minus point and taking the plus point and good behavior for granted. And this pointing out the minus point repeatedly by all really uh, brings their spirit down and they lose interest. So I often uh, request my teacher, try to focus on their strength, try to motivate them, even if the answer is partially correct, appreciate. And this genuine appreciation coming from teacher is the greatest motivator. But very rarely we are using, we are very uh, conjuice, stingy <laughs> in giving uh, appreciation. But to pull down, we are ever ready. So I think we as a teacher need to really love and care. And all the problem children, if you uh, talk to them individually, I don't blame them. If they are having problem, my children, uh, about 10, 15 I have out of 1,000, 10, 15 children, most of them, either they are semi-often, either they have mother or no father, or nobody at home, they have gone abroad, and the environment is not there, the emotional security is not there at home and at school. We bang them left and right. So what can we expect? Are we not responsible, not understanding? So I think teachers' work is not only teaching the subject or the content. We teachers need to really feel for these children, understand their background, motivate them, inspire them, and slowly, I'm sure, they will s start shining. The, all that they need is love, care, and sometimes pull them up with a strong word, because we have to use different mechanism. It's not just theory X and Y. 75 staff means I have to use 75 theory, <laughs> not two. <laughs> so therefore, it's not a straight jacket strategy. 
depending upon the situation, body language, and their attitude, we have to keep on changing our strategy to make them change their attitude, change their work culture. And once we change the teacher's work culture, automatically you'll find there's a change in the culture of teaching and learning in the classroom. Thank you so much. Uh, quality is really a very complex matter. And uh, we have to address uh, the teacher quality, and uh, we have to address the curriculum quality, we have to address the environment quality, and uh, the uh, and the teaching aids, and also the administration, uh, you know, skills and uh, things like that. So unless we, uh, you know, address all these issues, then we cannot think about a quality education because it uh, is a component of all these uh, elements. <coughs> <coughs> Um, so, we talked about a teacher in the morning, and then uh, you see that also contains the element of pedagogy. Pedagogically, <coughs> the teachers should be sound in a manner that they are able to teach properly in the class, uh, you know, so that they can transmit the message or transmit the, the, the you know, communication to the uh, to the students in the right manner, as I said, and uh, establishing the two-way communication. Through that, we can create um, a creative thinker, increase to make them inquisitive, to make them, you know, independent thinker and things like that, because this is the objective of uh, education. In a way, we can say that, you know, not uh, getting the high mark. Because uh, many of the you know greatest scientists and the thinkers that we have are not the best reproducers of the informations they have received in their classrooms, but rather they are originally the best thinkers. You know that is how they have become. And in our modern education systems, we have not been able to produce you know great scientists and uh, you know great thinkers as many as uh, it has been produced. Uh, with the other education systems in the past. So in Buddhist you know, education system, to make uh, someone, to make the student inquisitive and to open the faculty of uh, you know, uh, inquiry and the faculty of uh, uh, investigation, that is, the, you know, that is the purpose of education. Because once you open it, because it does not just uh, the uh, faculty of inquiry and the exercise of inquiry does not stop there at this you know time of student but it goes all the way down till the end of your life because after all tattu darshan that is the the essence knowing the essence of the things right and up to that if one can lead then really one realizes the essence of what, you know self and essence of the universe and that is how in buddhist uh, uh, you know, education system, the logic and epistemology plays a very predominant role, prominent role. And uh, logic is not an abstract kind of phenomena, entity, but rather it is a process of learning and knowing, you know, having access, getting access into the reality. Just as in the science, uh, one has to go into laboratory and then do lots of experiments and things like that. But in Buddhist uh, education system and in the philosophical system, one has to work, you know, thought process, go through the thought laboratory. And uh, with the discussions with teachers and one's own contemplatives and to through, through going th uh, in a long process of these things, then only one comes to the end of realizing the reality. So that may not be a major reality of uh, the ultimate reality of uh, phenomena, but it could be a reality of uh, even very small things, right? So this kind of uh, things should be started and uh, the cultivation of uh, investigation, cultivation of uh, the you know um, faculty of uh, inquiry, these should get started in the classroom itself through exchange, through interaction with the teachers, and make them more you know uh, engaging. And the teacher has to make the students more engaging, more you know make them interactive, 
And through that, they can, through that, each of the student can feel that our classroom is uh, the exercise, whole exercise is a joint venture, not something observing from outside, something happening with the teacher and some couple of students, but every student in the class should feel that this is a joint venture that we, you know, process. Because in our monasteries, we have this kind of exercise. The teacher, there are different levels of uh, teaching methods. For someone in the beginning, and uh, for some texts particularly, there is a need of, uh, you know, to go word by word and sentence by sentence. And this is uh, the practice, you know, prevalent with the Tibetan as well as with the, science, the Sanskrit, because it is said that pangdi lagana. So we, and uh, particularly with the, you know, texts of philosophy and texts of logic, and Pangdi Lagana is a very, you know, tough time and a tough, tough job. And so unless the teacher teaches each and every word and their relation to other words are taught very specifically, it is very difficult to unnote the whole, you know, sentence. So, but uh, in certain cases, the teacher just reads uh, some passages or shlokas and then talk, gives a general lecture and then discusses, uh, unfolds the whole issue and then discusses about that. And then the top level kind of, you know, teaching method in our monastery is that uh, the teacher does not, you know, read out the text. He, when the students come, then he just raises some issues and then starts, you know, discussing on these and debating on these issues. And the, the some of the students, uh, they don't subscribe, you know, flatly they don't subscribe to what the teacher says, but they argue vehemently with the teacher. And then at the end uh, they, you know, go out of the class, not with the solutions, but s with some questions. And then th further they go to the debate courtyard and then, uh, you know, uh, go into those uh, process of investigation. And sometimes they find some results or some, you know, answers to their questions. But then again, they come back to the classroom and uh, or they come back to the scholar and debate it again. In that process, the students are always in constantly in the process of inve investigation and inquiry. So this, I think, is a very high level of, you know, a teaching method, you know, met method methodology. So this uh, kind of thing that His Holiness has also uh, emphasized to introduce uh, debate in the Tibetan school. And I think, uh, and many scientists and, uh, and educationists in the West have also said that uh, this method is uh, certainly a very wonderful, you know, method to be, uh, uh, to, to, to be uh, introduced in the school education system. So in many of the schools, in Tibetan schools, uh, the debate is, uh, you know, uh, introduced. And I think that would certainly not only benefit the Tibetan studies or Tibetan philosophy or something like that, Buddhist philosophy, but this will enhance the knowledge of uh, mathematics, science, and other, you know, subjects as well. And then, at the same time, I think uh, the uh, introduction of meditation in schools is very important. You know, in the beginning of the class, if we can introduce me meditation, this has been practiced and introduced in many schools in the Western countries, in many schools in the European countries, and many schools in the United States, not in the universities, but in the schools. Uh, we were in a, a conference in uh, Hamburg, and one educationist uh, when while she was doing you know giving some teachings and uh, then she introduced meditation in in the classrooms she narrated some of uh, her you know experiments and she said that uh, she introduced meditation in the class of uh, sixth and seventh grades and uh, this many of the students in the beginning they did not uh, you know uh, appreciate that but after a week or or later, then they started appreciating it to such an extent that uh, they demand meditation in the beginning of the class. And one day, because of certain reason, the meditation class could not happen because of some other program. And then there was a student, a black student, and uh, after that, uh, you know, the next class, she found him missing, and then she went to search him out, and he was meditating at a corner of the library. And then when he asked that, what are you doing? Then he said that, um, I found this meditation extremely helpful to pacify my, my mind, to keep, you know, calm my mind and, and to, you know, develop uh, attention towards your lecture and study. 
So that is why since today this morning I couldn't do it because of other programs. So I have been there to do some meditation so that I can start the day with a you know, productive manner. So actually he or that boy has a problem at home because of some, you know, um, uh, some problem at home. So therefore at school he has, uh, you know, uh, changed, uh, he had changed a lot and because of the uh, introduction of the meditation, so this has been very productive in many ways and many students have, uh, you know, appreciated this in developing their faculty of attention and things like that. So, and also you know that uh, uh, attention deficiency crisis, uh, uh, ADC, and this is being addressed these days by mindfulness-based meditations and things like that, right? And also then there is uh, mindfulness-based uh, uh, stress reduction and things like that. These are being introduced not only in schools but in the adult society in order to address many of the social, uh, you know, problems. So I think this would be certainly a wonderful, you know, uh, practice if we can introduce meditation because this sharpens one's mind and uh, develops uh, concentration. And the moment that you start, you know, keep uh, introspecting yourself, you know, watching your mind, then really from there you start to read yourself and know yourself better and how you are functioning, what are the deficiencies within yourself and things like that. And then they can develop the antidotal ma methods to develop you know, compassion and uh, uh, concentration and things like that. So <coughs> then the another thing is evaluation system. The evaluation system, certainly we need to be very careful. Evaluation system is not just to confine to the uh, writing examination, but uh, within the writing examination also there are different you know, methods uh, that can be developed. And uh, in my university, um, we have uh, developed uh, the, you know, uh, designing, redesigning the question paper in a very different manner. So earlier, it used to be, as we have in mostly, you know, in all the universities, uh, write five questions uh, uh, from among the, you know, following, you know, questions, right? So, uh, so selecting five out of eight or something like that. So students guess those questions, and then they don't study the textbooks thoroughly. Rather, they choose some of the, the, you know, um, some of the, sel you know, some some of those important I I areas. But then what we did, uh, we you know, developed uh, the question paper in such a manner that uh, it covers the entire uh, you know, textbook and in a very different manner, in short form, in, uh, you know, and very short form and short form questions and uh, lengthy question and lastly, uh, analytic essay type of question. So altogether there are eight, seven, um, 28 to 30 questions. And each of these question, or each of these question block would demand your information, your analysis, and your reflection. So that is quite, you know, kind of, you know, demanding. So after introducing this, the very culture of students' you know, study changed, totally changed. They never used to, you know, resort to some of the prepared, you know, question answers and things like that, and guessing some questions uh, from the previous uh, examination papers and things like that. Rather, they used to, you know, they study thoroughly the text from, you know, from the right, from the beginning to the very end. So therefore, from till the, you know, colophon, right? So this made a big change. And then after that, we uh, included a presentation. Every Saturday, the student has to make a presentation, and that is also, uh, we started the practice uh, uh, four years back, and uh, from this year we included that uh, into examination evaluation systems by, you know, um, by by uh, giving ten marks for presentation. So every Saturday the students have to make presentation, and the teachers evaluate that on that basis, and then they they have uh, the assignments, and the assignments are also evaluated, and then the attendance is also. 85% is the minimum requirement. So those who go beyond 85, they cannot appear at the examination. Those who go above 85, then they score some marks, uh, uh, you know, out of 10. So 
And still, I'm not very satisfied because we need a much more closer kind of evaluation through interaction with the individual student. Because in our tradition, we have this kind of you know, Buddhist and Tibetan tradition. We have, uh, uh, you know, through debate system and through personal interaction, we have a system of evaluating evaluating the students, how much they have you know, understood the subject matter, how deeply the student has gone into, and things like that. So I want this to be introduced in our m university evaluating system. I don't know how far I will be successful, but uh, uh, through that, uh, what we can assess is we can assess the, the contemplation power, the hearing power, and the uh, meditation power or th their acquaintance with the subject matter, right? So if we can go that much deeper into the subject matter and into the understanding of the students, you know, uh, the subject itself, then I think we can, uh, you know, relatively uh, go deeper into the subject uh, in terms of e evaluating them, right? So. And these are some of the you know observations. There are so many different you know angles through which we can improve the quality. But uh, uh, I think uh, this time I will just to confine it to these issues. Thank you very much. One is technology. Nobody touched on the topic technology, the use of technology, and we cannot do a, whether you call it a blessings or curse in disguise. But you know the technology we are using here. So these days, you know, children, how fast they learn, get the information. Now, the quality education, I'm not, uh, we have discussed a lot about the uh, inherent, like the inner uh, education, development, okay, there's no question being a Buddhist, right, his holiness uh, advices and teaching, right, is going on. Now, if you want to go along uh, uh, in the 21st century education, now, we haven't seen the future. Now, it's a paradigm shift in future. Where will I be? We've, uh, nobody has seen future. But at least we can prepare them. Technology, for example, uh, for, I'm not saying that you have to give the tech, uh, you know, depend too much on the technology, but it really helped. In our school, for example, like uh, we allow class nine and above to keep laptops and some the MP3, the audios with proper monitoring system. And what it helped with the students, okay, when we checked what they are listening for, they are listening to different lectures, the great, uh, uh, the lectures, the TED Talks, and then uh, scholars' lectures, His Holiness' uh, speeches, right? So on daily basis, whether they were eating, when we were walking outside in the park, they listen, they educate themselves, not necessarily confined inside the four walls of the classroom. So it helped. And we also boldly asked, <coughs> you know, like a uh, laptop, in the laptop also, so that the uh, rest of the students who cannot afford the laptop, who their sponsors, their parents, they give laptop to them. So they use project works. So lots of project works on laptop. And also access to the internet. So they learn with a proper monitoring system. They learn a lot. They can interact with students out there in the world. So they learn a lot of information with the click of a button. But there was a time when a teacher faced lots of problems teaching about the, uh, what he called uh, ozone leakage. And it says in the O3. Then in NASA, they have explained in the YouTube a small you know, uh, clip. And uh, she used it and said, oh, you must do and understood easily. Sometimes when we face a problem of a teacher, yes, we face a, uh, face a problem of teacher, mathematic teacher, science teacher, there's a great, you and cry this morning, I told you. So if we install the software like a Khan Academy, uh, I, uh, so the, the, the DTC, all those lectures, so many so good software inside, and then we monitor them, and then with the help of the teacher, say uh, class six, class seven, class eight, these are the topics they can. So during three hours, they go there and they listen, and say for example, Khan Academy. In the Khan Academy, he teaches the mathematics same as the teacher teaches in the classroom. And that it is free. And also the way he speaks in Prince English also. And then you can ask thousand times to that uh, kind of game. You can stop, you can learn. For an actual teacher there, I'm not saying you need to substitute that, but when you face the difficulties of the teacher, it helps. So technology, I think, can be used if you use it properly, judiciously. It really helps. And uh, so uh, the parents, so we say that we need to help 
there's great so many stakeholders to have the students. So parents outside, many parents, I'm not saying all, there are many substantial not, uh, parents, they are least bothered about uh, their children. They say, they'll care my children inside, they, it'll, they'll take care of it. And they do business. And many ch the parents, they are least bothered. Therefore, the children, since in their family members, there's no one educated, so they face the problem there. So this is what I'm saying. The parents from the academic, from the ministry or educational uh, department, why not s make a program in the publicly? Say, for example, here are so many prayers. Prayer, right? The teaching, he's on his teaching going on. There the Maglagench skit, plays, right? And uh, you know, any TV show on education. Parent a magazine specifically how to educate. I mean, uh, what I'm saying, general public education, you know, uh, needs to be uplifted. So I think it is very important. And lastly, the stress. Many children come to school, and the teachers and the parents, home mothers, they should understand how brain, right, related to their learning. Because what happens? Because science has proved. In the limbic system, you know, like the cognitive system, when you are active and you have no stress, that neocortical uh, part of the cerebrum, lots of energy goes there, and then you become reasoning. But once you are stressed, what happens? Then emotional reptilian and the mammalian brain, lots of energy goes down there, no reasoning comes out. So it is very common. When there are so many, lots of emotionalized, the limbic system, the amygdala and the insula, so they get enlarged, and there's no question for them to learn. Whatever teacher teaches, no result. Despite all good theories, despite all the uh, uh, good teachers and all the facilities, because they have stress. So home condition, home, especially, you know, home needs to be a congenial, happy home where there's a love and a no, it should take place because uh, Mr. Ramu, uh, Professor Ramu explained, Dr. Ramu explained that about the compassion, based on compassion, um, you know, you can help children become, I mean, <laughs> successful student. So this is, I thought, you know, these are the some important issue I left out, so I thought of sharing. Thank you. Uh, I've been uh, invited back. Uh, Professor Krishna Kumar to say a few words, and then actually, we uh, you know agreed uh, as a you know pr as a DOE staff not to s come in and you know say anything while we you know we were waiting for our distinguished panel to you know mm, sh shower their wisdom, experiences, expertise. But uh, what I wanted to say right now uh, is actually when we were talking about equality, uh, uh, well, there it is a subjective matter, definitely, and it's a very relative also. So it's difficult to actually put into some kind of uh, one really concise and precise thing. But uh, to me, uh, I would even like to take it as a, a uh, you know, kind of standard, uh, standard of education, for instance.